I'd like to welcome everyone to our first online artist panel. I know there's so many other things vying for your time and for your attention, and we appreciate that you're spending this evening with us. So my name is Deborah Monk, and I'm the manager of the Artist in Residence program and the education program at Recology. And before I start, I'd like to acknowledge like the most amazing and wonderful and talented staff, starting with Felicia Castaneda, who's the supervisor of the Artist in Residence program and the Environmental Learning Center, Elsa Haru, who's our education specialist, and our newest member to the team, Victor Yanez Lascano, who will be leading the panel. So if you have any questions during the talk, please type them into the Q&A and we'll answer as many as possible at the end. Or if you have like technical issues, then please type your um, issue into the chat box and one of us will help you. Okay, next slide. So very briefly, Recology is a private employee owned recycling and composting company um, that initially really had nothing to do with the arts. Uh, but over the years, the artist in residence program has been has become like an integral part of who we are as a company. And while the company Recology is celebrating 100 years in 2020 this year, the Recology Artist in Residence program is celebrating 30 years, which is a huge milestone for us. Uh, and during this time, we've worked with over 200 Bay Area artists who typically spend four months scavenging for materials, working in a studio and talking to tour groups, tour groups all in preparation for a three-day opening and artist talk. And we, um, every year we typically host around nine artists, which is six professional artists and an additional three um, university students who work in all mediums, like including photography and video, installation, performance, sound, and sculpture. If you've been to one of our openings, you've seen the breadth of the work created. And we have an advisory board of arts professionals who help us select the artists for the main program. So to celebrate 30, we held an exhibition at Art Gallery downtown San Francisco for the professional program in December and January. And I remember when we scheduled it, I was so worried because it was so early in the year, but now I'm so thankful that at least that part of our celebration happened before COVID. And the student exhibition that you see here was planned for May, but obviously because of COVID, we were, it was never seen by the public. So to honor the students, we decided to host a series of videos and this artist panel. Next slide. This is the student studio. It's a, a 40 foot shipping container. There's electricity, but it is pretty bare boned. Um, artists do have full-time access to the learning center, which you saw a minute ago, where we have a kitchen and a classroom and offices and a space for them to work, but they usually stay in their studio. Next slide. Before I hand it over to Victor, I would like to acknowledge the 50 other student artists in residence um, who have spent four months scavenging in the public disposal area and working and then having an exhibit, holding an exhibition. It's a really great opportunity for students because by the time they've graduated, either from their undergrad or their graduate program, they've already had a solo residency, had an exhibition and had a, held an artist talk. Um, and so it, the program is for only for enrolled Bay Area students at college and university and either undergrad or graduate programs. All artists receive a stipend and administrative support and we um, accept applications throughout the year. Um, but more often than not, students are referred by their professors and many of whom were once recology artists in residence. Next slide. For tonight's event, I've asked Recology staff member and um, artist Victor Yanez Lascano to moderate the discussion. He joined our staff following his residency and solo exhibition, Long Division, which ended in late January of 2020. His exhibition focused on the use and subtle transformation of materials that are directly related to manual labor. This work further expanded his research on how language and labor have contributed to the formation of his family's US Mexican immigrant identity. Inspired by oral histories and firsthand accounts, his work utilizes photography, 
video performance, sculpture, and installation to poetically chronicle the varying degrees of assimilation occurring within his family. Victor holds an MFA in art practice from Stanford University, a BFA in photography from Columbia College, Chicago, and since 2008 has been passionately involved in art education. You can engage with one of his most recent pieces, You and I, Is Us, Is We, through the Bay Area fundraiser, Possible Refrigerator Show, created by Muse Collective. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ricky, I mean, to Victor, who will lead the conversation. Cool, thank you, Deborah. Um, and thank you, artists, for being here. And also, uh, thanks for all of our viewers for making it out today and make some, making some time to check out our, our first talk. Um, also, a huge thanks to all of the staff who are helping to make this program run smoothly tonight behind the scenes. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce you to tonight's panel. And having been a fellow resident myself, I'm excited by the opportunity to talk with these four guests tonight about their work and their experiences at Recology. I cannot say that when, when I was an, I cannot say that when I was an undergrad, I ever felt prepared enough to embark on such a journey. And it certainly takes a specific willingness to try something of this nature, a residency that is while in school. And furthermore, a great deal of drive to show up for oneself in this way. So it is no surprise that these four artists, as well as those, as well as those who have come before them and after, that they go on to do wonderful things with their talents and creativity. I am delighted that we not only get to revisit these works, but also re-celebrate their achievements. Surely we will learn a great deal from them tonight. And for any of you prospective applicants, uh, we hope that tonight's program finds within you the excitement and curiosity needed to participate in this residency. Now for the artists. Our first guest, Jinmei Chi, comes to us tonight from Ontario, Canada. Jin May was a resident artist in 2016, along with air residents Ramakan Oarwisters and Anya Ulfeldt. Prior to her residency, her work utilized found objects to explore the dilemmas and questions concerning her Chinese Canadian identity. She received her BFA from the California College of the Arts, where she majored in sculpture and minored in visual studies. Jin May is currently the children's program coordinator at the Kingston School of Art in Kingston, Ontario. Our second guest, Ricky Dwyer, comes to us from the Bay Area. Dwyer was a resident artist in 2019, along with air residents, Alicia Escott and Cal Spelitic. Their practice combines sculpture, printmaking, and ceramics to reflect the potential of cloth as an embodied form. Dwyer received their undergraduate degree from the Savannah College of Art and Design and an art practice MFA from UC Berkeley and has since exhibited at numerous galleries throughout the Bay Area, including the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. Our third guest, Hannah Beatrice Quinn, comes to us tonight from her new home in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Quinn was a resident artist in 2013, along with air residents, Benjamin Cowden and Ian Treasure. She brought to her residency a great deal of interest in functional art that wove together art, play and craft as a way to challenge conventional concepts. Hannah graduated from Cal the California College of the Arts in 2014. Her work has been exhibited throughout the Bay Area, including the San Francisco Museum of Craft and Design and the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts. And our final guest, Shushan Tesfuzikta. She comes to us tonight also from the Bay Area. Shushan was a resident artist in 2014, along with artist Samuel Levi Jones and Jeremy Rourke. Her work leading up to the residency and currently is dedicated to advancing and supporting larger sustainable and community development goals through art production, cradle to career initiatives and just transition strategies. Shushan holds a BFA from California College of the Arts and recently completed her master's in city and regional planning at the University of California, Berkeley. Welcome guests. Um, so uh, before we begin with the Q and A uh, or the questions and looking at your artwork, I thought it would be a good idea to give the audience a sense of you know what you proposed for the residency, uh, how that might have, uh, how you followed through on that, or how it might have changed, and think about the the works that you created during the residency. Uh, in the last slide, there are four slides for each of you. The last slide. Uh, 
is the piece that ended up going into the permanent collection for Recology. And maybe you can spend a little time talking about your thought process through that piece. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and start off with Jin Mei. Um, so my proposal, so the question is um, how my proposal has changed. Um, my proposal was very much related, related to my work at the time. It was a lot of, um, um, the central theme is again about myself being an Asian Canadian um, uh, person. And just, um, I think it was about, um, I think it was called Collision. I'm trying to recall with memory, it was called Collision. It was supposed to be um, a series of larger structures um, that would have some sort of um, impact or implied uh, impact that has done to it. So I had created a small miniature model to illustrate what I was proposing to do at Recology, but in a larger scale at Recology. So I had um, the model I created was a very small version of a ceramic home. And it was, um, it was crashed down by um, Mao's um, book, the Little Red Book. So at recall, I've always wanted to make a, almost like a size of a, um, the room, a version of that miniature. So I thought Recology would give me that opportunity to make a much larger work. However, um, it did not go that way because as soon as I saw the mountains of trash, there are so many um, different ideas that came to mm -hmm. mind. So instead of creating those work, I just, really just worshiped what was what was found at the mm. recycling center. And I think it was my it, it was it was my fourth year, senior year. So I was moving and I had a lot of trash myself, a lot of things <laughs> that I want <laughs> I want put a lot of meanings and values into. And then very soon they were absolutely and I didn't care about them anymore. So I had to um, my four years at California was supposed to be a big adventure, but what's left behind is a bunch of evidence of my <laughs> lifestyle. And it, it speaks a lot about who I am, my trash, mm. kind of like the carcasses of my existence. And it's kind of um, this, the kind of evidence I want to toss away. And so I recology, I felt like I was able to like, be very voyeuristic and just see other people's life based mm -hmm. on the trash they toss away. It's kind of like a self-portrait for our society. I know that's a very big statement, but <laughs> sure, sure. in our trash, we can definitely see a lot. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's enough. Yeah, and then this, this last slide here is um, what ended up uh, entering the permanent collection at Recology. So could you talk a little bit about your thoughts behind creating this particular section um, that was acquired? Absolutely. So I was definitely uh, very obsessed with buying things or, um, uh, well, maybe not more than most. It's just having, you know, just um, new things or things that are going to make my life more convenient or, um, making me kind of, um, how to say, it? it's kind of like how you evolve yourself is with stuff. So mm -hmm. with this technology, I'm able to do this faster. With this product, I'm able to um, um, kind of aggregate or advance my own flesh and bones. So it's kind of, in a way, I bought so much stuff myself that I felt like if I had packaged things that people throw away, it, like would I even be able to tell the difference? Perhaps mm. I just needed to be purchasing and consuming. It didn't, it, it was the opposite of being materialistic because if I was very materialistic, then I would actually care about the object, the materials I had purchased, but I did not care. It was, it, it was kind of this, this like void I'm trying to fill. Yeah. by buying stuff. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, Jinmei. I, I think, is everyone frozen? 
Oh, Justin Mayhan is moving. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, and we'll come back to ask you some more questions about the work uh, in a moment. So next we'll hear from Ricky Dwyer. Uh, Ricky Dwyer. Uh, so again, if you can just kind of go through your, your, your proposal and what you did at the residency and then break down that last piece that was collected. Yeah, I remember my proposal. I was trying to find it and I couldn't um, find the way I'd written it, but I knew that I wanted to be producing textiles from found waste. That was my intention. Um, I am a weaver and a sculptor. Um, so I was kind of aware that recology had a loom. Um, I also have a couple in my studio, but I was hoping, I think, to gather materials that I could um, slice up into linear elements and then weave with that. So I was even like researching how to turn plastic bottles into yarn um, and different things that I could spin from and then weave into cloth and weave into textiles. Um, and I think I was certainly really overwhelmed with the process, but I also had a really magical experience of um, once I arrived at Recology, realizing that they already had this whole archive of um, a previous weavers like dye lots from um, doing a lot of like natural dye research and projects. So they just had boxes and boxes and boxes of yarn and that yeah. was so much more stimulating to me to um, kind of have this preserved archive from a single artist that was still in the area and she ended up coming to the show, which was really wonderful to get to meet her. Um, so I focused on mainly weaving with that material as a singular um, thing to dive into, um, her work and her legacy. And then I was doing more printmaking with textiles that I had already found or things that could be um, seen as textiles. So a lot of other flexible materials, plastics um, on carpet pad, um, things in which have replaced textiles over time or have become more efficient for what we had been using cloth for. Um, and so, yeah, I ended up doing a ton of prints I still had access to the print shop at UC Berkeley um, and then weaving mainly from the archive of yarn that was already there with the loom. Well, and then this piece that uh, it's quite large. It's, I think to see it on a slideshow, I mean, even to see the, the dimensions here doesn't really do it justice, right? Uh, seeing this in person at the exhibition, uh, recording it and photographing it, I was just very impressed by its scale. Um, and it also like you also don't get to see the, the fine details of where they intersect. Could you talk about uh, your thoughts behind this piece? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I had this whole abundance of yarn from this woman, Carrie Levine, that had donated her collection to Ecology. And so it was just boxes and boxes and boxes um, of like lots of little small individual cotton dyed in cochineal and silk dyed in woad and all of these different um, wonderful remnants that she had had and hadn't um, donated as a lot together. And she also had all of her incredible dye books, just records and records of years worth of personal research. Um, and I was sorting it and mining it and figuring out what to do with it. But it was also more of an abundance than I've really ever had before. So I got to work so much larger and test things out on that scale. Um, but in one of the sorting processes, it was, um, Categorizing colors, I think I had the entire uh, shipping container unit, the whole floor and every table covered in trying to make gradients out of all of these individual little dye lots, um, grouping them in different fashions. Um, and she ended up having the most of reds and then greens. Um, and so I was weaving two cloths that then switched places right in the middle um, and weaving them so that they both desaturated in the middle, um, trying to achieve a place in which they were the same color, even though they're complementary. Um, mm -hmm. So that the point in which they do intersect, they're most similar. Um, and I was thinking a lot about her legacy and me coming up as a young weaver um, and material resources and um, being in lineage with knowledge in the Bay Area because craft is so much about the lineage of knowledge. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much, Ricky. Um, Hana, would you care to tell us a little bit about your proposal, what you worked on, how it might have changed while you were there, and then um, yes. talk about well, that? I had to look up my proposal. Um, <laughs> it's been a very long time. Um, and my proposal was to, I was studying furniture design at the time. I was in my third year. 
Um, and my proposal was to find uh, functional pieces and because uh, uh, coming on the tour, I had seen a lot of like functional pieces in the pile that were maybe slightly broken. Um, and so I sort of had this idea that I was gonna come and rescue them and bring back their value. Um, later in my work, like value and perceived value and how we see the things that we own and use has become a large part of my work. And I can see now looking back that that was both present in the proposal and what I ended up doing while I was um, in residence. Um, I really did want to make functional work because seeing that pile of um, like discarded things makes you think that about like what it can still be used um, and what might not be thrown away or how to make something that somebody will value enough that they won't throw it away. Um, one thing I found uh, as in the slide here was a lot of Ikea furniture. And so I started to investigate like turning that into uh, like different type of furniture. And so these were like pine Ikea bed slats that I found, which seemed like this great lumber source um, that we saw like every week there'd be more bed slats. So I just started collecting that. Um, and just the other thing I found, like, and there was a lot of like scrap wood and um, using scraps to make new things um, was really interesting to me. And it, I saw all this scrap and thought that like, about how other people might not be able to use this, their scraps that they're throwing away. Um, and so with the stool project, I felt like I was using like all of San Francisco's scrap to make these new useful objects of stools and numbering them and then sending them back out into the world. Um, so at my show, lots of people um, took home stools. Wow. Um, and just, like the, the other alarming thing in the pile were um, things we grow out of. So we saw a lot of like toys or small furniture and kid sized furniture. And so where does something become all ages, I guess? Um, so these were adult sized blocks um, that can double, that still have that playful nature, but can double as a piece of furniture. Um, and thinking about furniture, not as like, when you think of a chair and you draw four legs and a seat and a back, but how can other objects be used? Um, and so that, yeah, so th that was the space. All right, thank you so much, Hannah. Um, and last, uh, Shushan, if you can tell us about your, your residency proposal and process and your last yeah. piece. Hi everyone, um, thanks for inviting me to be a part of this talk, it's really nice to reflect on a time um, that was very memorable to me during my time at CCA. Um, I was a resident in 2014 and I was a junior um, in undergrad. I, by that time I switched my major to being an individualized major. Um, I had come into my um, program where I came to school as an industrial design major, but was very uh, disappointed with with their sort of imagination when it came to um, objects and um, I was lucky enough to um, have the liberty to create my own um, my own major and so I was flirting with with craft courses and textile courses and um, at the time I was trying to figure out how to um, sort of um, replace the values that I was rubbing up against in the in my design courses by these other values that I was finding in my textile courses that valued craft and labor and material in a way that, that I found more satisfying. Um, and prior to starting this residency, I had found um, data cables, like discarded data cables, and I, I was started using them to weave. So, um, if I'm remembering correctly, I proposed um, just weaving functional objects. Um, I remember my first few days at the residency, I, I would just look for 
like a thing a weaving material and um i uh, um and was just sort of just like in a uh like yeah in a gathering phase and i it was really wonderful to to care for them and and wash them and clean them and sort them by color and i was also collecting um metal frames and bars and i think what was most exciting was finding these crates and um, like in this the slide before using that as um, a seat and so some of the objects I made um, were functional and some were more sculptural um, it was really exciting for me I also um, made a backstrap loom and um, it was exciting for every single piece to be uh, made out of something that was found um, and during my uh, my opening, um, I uh, wove with um, with guests who came to see my show, and that was really exciting. Um, yeah, I think this. I I always um, look back to this residency and ref and refer back to it when I um, am in conversation about waste streams and um, and e waste and. Um, uh our relationship to materials um for me this residency was really important because it was like it was like evidence i needed about like what was wrong with our like relationship to to material mm -hmm. and objects sure, sure. yeah and then um <clears throat> so this is the piece that ended up being collected uh by recology is there uh is there anything specific you'd like to share about this uh, particular piece? I mean, it has the elements that you talked about in it. Um, yeah. And again, seeing this in person uh, is is quite uh, quite impressive. This was my I this was my favorite piece that I made. Um, I think I also like the blue the blue piece I made. I a lot of my I have that with me in my apartment, and a lot of my friends um, have been sitting on it for the past six years. So. <laughs> That one, that feels like a family member to me. But this one, I was just really excited. Um, I think some of the experiments I made were less successful and maybe a little more precarious and uh, uh, were hard, not, not as like strong, but this one was wonderful. I, I don't know what the, the black metal bar was, but that's, that's also exciting and um, I like how some parts of this this seat are not functional, like the two bars, uh, like the white and black bar that are wrapped with like the wire cord. Um, yeah, I think I was just really I was just really proud of this piece, cool. and and how well it supported someone. Awesome, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. So. Um, so now I'm going to ask two of you uh, to kind of reflect, uh, you know, at the beginning of the residency, uh, maybe <clears throat> during the orientation, in fact, uh, we're told, you know, be prepared to be kind of emotionally moved by the amount of waste that you see coming into the PRRA, right, where we end up collecting the goods that we want to make artwork with. And I know myself, uh, when I went into this space uh, for the tour, I was kind of surprised by the amount, but um, I didn't think I was going to actually feel what they had warned us about. And um, I was wondering if Jin uh, and Hannah, perhaps you can kind of reflect, because you, you were all like looking for such a wide variety of materials. Like, what were some of the, the thoughts and emotions that went through uh, your, your mind and what you felt in your body when you approached this? If, in fact, it kind of like overwhelmed you and, you know, how did you end up kind of working through that to to get to the place where you're like, okay, I have to make art from this uh, this material. So either one of you can answer. Jin or, uh, Jin or Hannah. Uh, if Jin or Hana can kind of reflect on on the first few days, maybe weeks of processing the amount of waste. Um, yeah, so I, it was seven and a half years ago, but <laughs> the, <laughs> I, it was hard to see the waste, but I felt like I was, I think I had this like 
quarter feeling where I was like rescuing it all. And I, cause I, my work was very tool heavy. I took a lot of materials back to my, to the shop at, at CCA. Um, and so I, in the first three weeks completely filled the shipping container to a point where you couldn't move because I had this feeling like, I, like I'm the only one here that can take all of this and do something with it. Um, and then I had to sort that out and return some of it, um, which, what, you know, in the end it was like, okay, well, if I can save it, I can save it, but it was headed to the trash already. Um, and then it was a finding things and just having to restrain myself from taking things just because they looked useful too. There's like this big, there are like the very useful things that are in the pile, like power strips. And you're like, well, I only really need like three power strips, but it's a useful thing. So I've got to take it. Or like, I, like, I don't know if, if anyone had that um, with like destroying things for the material, like a power strip where you might want to cut the end off to use it as a cord, but it was really a perfectly functional power strip. Um, and so that was a big struggle too, of just like, this is the useful thing, I need it versus what's good, what is my work going to be from the time. Um, and so it was definitely a month of like, I need this, I need this, I need this. And then like, oh wait, I gotta make something. And then <laughs> like looking through like pages of sketches of everything I could possibly make with all of the stuff I'd pulled out and trying to narrow it down because that's where it's overwhelming. It's like, I can do, I can do so much with this. Mm, yeah, yeah. I see Shushan, you're nodding uh, quite a bit in agreement with uh, what Hannah's saying in, in terms of the the relationship to the materials in those first few weeks. Yeah, it was it was uh, it was very overwhelming to see um, just so much like to see everyone's trash because like the whole city's trash ended up here, and um, it was very daunting as just one person. Uh, I, I mean, I was surrounded by staff and and uh, folks who worked at the dump, um, but there's only so much that you can do. And so I, I, I agree with Hannah's sentiment. Yeah. And Jin, you also, like Hannah, were, at least in your exhibition, had like such a wide variety of material you were working with. Um, what was that process like for you when you first kind of entered the space and began collecting? Sorry, are you, you're calling me, right, Jin? Yeah, Jin, Jin Mei, oh, sorry. Right. Yeah. sorry. No sorry. worries. I was, I'm not super sure. That is my brother's <laughs> name, but he's not here. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh, Jin Mei, Jin Mei. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I definitely relate to what Hannah said because, again, I did uh, confess at the very beginning that I have a um, toxic relationship with buying things and materials, at least more than I like to. I don't even think it's more than usual. It's just, um, I, I don't know if uh, a lot of, of you know that the process is that we go in with a shopping cart and then we fill the shopping cart with stuff. Great, <laughs> great transition. Nice. And, then we, <laughs> and then we go to um, this very, um, it's like a big scale and then we weigh the shopping cart and then we have, they have to record, the, the folks that work there have to record how much um, waste we're using for their reference. So every time I have this feeling of, oh boy, I came, I went for one thing, I came out with a cartload of things, just like <laughs> I am with shopping. So I really relate to Hannah's, uh, Hannah's sentiment that, you know, it's just, um, there was a lot of distraction and there's a lot of, uh, okay, I'm here to do some work. <laughs> not to, you know, feel bad for these materials or not to, um, think what can be reused for my own purpose. So that was very interesting. And I think that was also the reason why I decided to make my work the way it looked. It was basically a little shopping mall. It was called this mall. And I think actually it was inspired by the shopping cart, the process of mm. constantly kind of uh, sorting or collecting materials shopping for materials and then having to return some because the shipping container is only so big. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's, it's interesting, you know, like thinking about this idea that it is trash. Uh, I think maybe, I don't know what people perceive uh, 
prior to this residency what trash is but I, I thought like going into it you know it's just going to be garbage bags and garbage bags of just like food and rotting material when in fact you know you're all talking about the the abundance of materials that are still as one might say perfectly good right mm -hmm. to use and uh it's interesting that you all it's no surprise that you all have a similar sentiment to the materials but oh, yeah thank you um I guess moving on to the next question in the next uh, set of slides, um, you know, you all, it's, it's pretty, it's beyond impressive, I think, to hear you all say, you know, this was my fourth year in school, this was my third year in school, when you did this residency, school in and of itself is already quite demanding and uh, the quality of work that you all produced during this residency is, you know, exceptional and the, the documentation uh, you know, is, is quite wonderful to like look at all of the work that you did. And I'm just wondering, you know, while you're in school, how this, uh, this experience, this several month experience might have bolstered the work that you were doing at school? Like what ideas might have carried over into your practice while you were at school taking other courses? Uh, and I'm just wondering, uh, maybe Ricky, you can start us off uh, with reflecting on that. And, um, and I know for some of you, right, it was a long time ago as, uh, you're reminding us, but um, I just, I, I myself can't imagine what it's like to be doing a residency while finishing up uh, school, but yeah. Uh, thank you, yeah. I think I might be the only one here that actually did the program while in graduate school. Um, oh, whoa. And I really made the brilliant decision of doing it during my last semester. So um, unfortunately, <laughs> my thesis exhibition for grad school and the recology opening were even on the same night. I ended up not being able to go to my recology opening. So it was um, challenging just logistically, I think, mm -hmm. what I think about the most. I mean, how down I had uh, coordinated Bay Area traffic to get to all of the places and do all of the things that whole semester is a little bit of a blur. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's so much abundance in the pit and the pile. So I was bringing truck, I have a wonderful truck. I was bringing truckloads of things back to Berkeley and back to my studio in Richmond. Um, and there was a ton of material crossover as well as um, just the magical feeling of, of, of needing something in particular and being able to walk into the pile and it kind of finding it in a way. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of instances in which I had a problem to solve and I was like, it's just gonna be there waiting for me. And it just kind of always was. Um, and I don't know wow. how I can tell that in my mind once I got there or not, but um, yeah, I just felt like the recology space was such a staple in being able to like help me sort through all of the things that I was doing and just constantly finding ways to solve my problems for me by providing me with enough wood or a tool this day or the right horse that I was looking for. I had a day when I really needed a pony and it just brought me this like incredible cast plastic kids toy with no undercuts, which is exactly what I needed. And um, a lot of magical experiences like that. Wow, right on. Wow, uh, residency during the last semester of grad school, that's intense. Uh, congrats for making it through that. Um, would anyone else like to reflect on their like experience while at Recology, uh, at Recology while simultaneously balancing the school schedule? Because it, it, I imagine it's, it's difficult for, for many. To be honest, I had a very, very uh, easy course load that mm. senior year because I had I had just taken a lot of courses <laughs> before, or that I actually had only one course left wow. to take and my senior show, but I decided to take two courses because it was cheaper. <laughs> it was the same cost. Mm. <laughs> two course or one course I took two um so I had paid half tuition so to be honest I had a much easier time than probably a lot of you having to do the full course load I just had the senior show and this on my plate and I think you uh Victor you asked about um how they might have influenced each other was this also for this question yeah, like did, did the Recology residency, you know, kind of like bolster, like support the practice that you were already kind of engaging with at school or did it like change the practice in any way? I actually have to say, I felt, I have to be honest, I felt a bit like an imposter because um, 
the, the show at two places are drastic, drastically different. Uh, one is about my Asian American or Asian, Asian Canadian identity um, and my sexuality. And one is about environmental <laughs> sustainability and my relationship with materials. So a lot of me felt um, like I was an imposter, but at the same time, I think it taught me to, um, from ecology, it taught me to make work that is not about my, I, I know making work about yourself is uh, very important as well. Just personally, personally, I think it was an important transition for me to start making work that is educational and that is a little bit one step outside of my own bubble. Um, so it well, was the yeah, contrast. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, cool. Anyone else have any thoughts on, on how this, the practice at Recology might have uh, been different than what you were doing at school. I mean, I, I like that it, the Jinmei, that you're saying that it was a separate kind of practice uh, for you, but perhaps uh, Hana or Shushan, I don't know if uh, what your experiences were like. Yeah, um, I I don't really remember how I felt um, juggling the residency in, in school, but I think the most important thing about my time at um, at Recology was um, just giving me the confidence to think about my work and my practice like outside of a school setting. And I think mm. um, I think that was really important um, because I think when you're in a vacuum of school, it's, it's really hard to, um, it can be hard to, to ask difficult questions about the, the way you, you might, uh, want to approach our practice. And I think for me at the time and at that age, it was the first time I was engaging with an audience like outside of my peers. And so I think for me, the residency was valuable in that sense. Yeah, no, you bring up a really good point, right? Because yeah. while we're in school, we're kind of both, you know, we're taking these classes and excelling at them, but we're also, you know, we're doing it for a grade to move on to the more advanced courses and then to eventually graduate Yeah. in this residency. Uh, you know, to, to kind of echo what you're saying, right? It presents an opportunity to uh, hold yourself accountable to your, your, yourself, right? You, of course, mm -hmm. you have to create work for the residency and you are offered this opportunity for a solo exhibition, but it's, it's all kind of on you. You're not getting graded uh, in any way. So yeah, it's, it's like, and again, I think this is why I was so impressed with the caliber of work that you all created during your residency, because uh, nothing about this reads as undergraduate or even you know, being a student at all, like all of this work uh, has the, you know, the professional caliber and its presentation and its execution. It's, it's really, it's, it's very impressive. It's great to, to see this come out of this residency. Thank you. Yeah. Um, cool, we'll move on to the next uh, thing we're curious about, you know, given the generous access of time, space and resources, um, this, this image right here by Hana really reminded me of uh, the, the things that I did as uh, rituals to kind of get myself primed for a day at the, at the dump uh, to get kind of inspired to, to do things. And I would kind of engage in certain rituals to, to you know, ignite ideas. And one of the things that I would do when I went to the residencies, I found this, this punch clock and because I was dealing with labor I was keeping track of the time that I was there. So I would always punch in, I would always punch out. Um, I put together this stereo. So I'd always like try to, you know, play music to get myself pumped up. But I'm, I'm curious, you know, like this looks like someone keeping a log, like a very meticulous log of something. And it's a specimen that Hannah brought. But this piece inspired me to, to ask you all, like, were there any rituals that you kind of did while you were there to make it feel like it was more of your space, more of your time? And I thought I'd uh, start with Hana since we're looking at your slide. Um, so rituals. When so when I was there, I didn't have access to the gallery to the gallery space or the environmental learning center. I was just in the shipping container. So if it was a weekend, um, I was just out there in the container. Um, I would mostly go and organize my space, collect materials. And at the time I had a truck, so I would almost every 
time I was there, fill the bed of my truck and take it back to school with me. Um, so not many rituals. My favorite thing to find, but also something that I felt that was hard for me to work into my work were these like little specimens that were evidence of other people's lives. And so like to-do lists, um, I tried really hard not to write lists of the things I needed, um, but I do in my work write to-do lists and try to keep a schedule. So that's, so I find lists very important, even if I don't stick to them. It's not about sticking to them. It's mm. just about jotting it down and kind of thinking through. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think my response to rituals is back to the last question of school happening too. Um, and for me, like that was the most busy, most productive time ever of my life so far. I think about it a lot as to why I can't do as much as I was doing then. Um, because I would like then load my truck and drive back to school and then work in the shop until 10 o'clock at night as a shop mm -hmm. monitor, which was great because most nights it was empty. And so I just had it to myself. Um, but yeah, all I was just going, there was not much ritual other than go collect, make, go to class. Yeah, right How about, uh, you know, another, some of the other work that I kind of noticed and pulled for these slides, right? Like I thought of like what it must've been like for you, Shushan, to kind of show up to the space and be like, all right, I'm gonna set up the record player. And I don't know if this is what you did a lot, but like when I saw this, I was like, well, this artist shows up, they set the space up like this and then they just get to, you know, yeah. making these pieces. That was the first thing I, I found. I found this record player and like a box of old, like soul music from, from like the 60s and 70s. And, and that was really exciting. And so, and then I also found a radio and some speakers. So I would listen to the radio and, and the records that I'd found every day when I was there while I wove. And so that was, that was exactly what came to mind when you asked what kind of rituals you had. Um, wow. Also just like cleaning, like listening to music and cleaning. Uh, I made a, I remember making, I just remembered I made a, a zine about like my weaving process. And one of the pages was about like singing while you work and like thinking about how women um, from my community like sing while they work. And um, yeah, uh, that, oh, right th that's, Is... that was very, that was um, a very enjoyable part of um, working like at the shipping container. Yeah, yeah. It looks like you also had great weather to be working outside. It was really warm. Yeah. <laughs> it was so hot in the shipping container. Um, it was spring. So I know I didn't work inside. It was too hot. So I had, there was some good sh uh, covering um, next to it. So I usually was posted up outside. Yeah. And just, and just so, uh, you know, folks watching, uh, if they're not familiar, if they haven't gone on a tour before the shipping container, at least where it is now is, uh, very close to where all the material goods that you're sourcing is at. So it's like, you don't have to walk very far and push the cart very far to, to get to your space. Uh, uh, but yeah, anyone else have any rituals? I mean, it's hard not to think of like getting into some sort of ritual when looking at all this yarn and like organizing, but I don't know if uh, you, Ricky, had any rituals going into, into this residency or that emerged from it. Um, no, I mean, actually what Shushan was saying really rings a bell with me too, the amount of things that I brought out and then the first thing I wanted to do was um, clean them all to have them in the shipping container. I think that really helped me also uh, set boundaries for how much I was bringing back for myself to keep it still a workable space and transform them from being something I found to something that I'm using and get to know a little bit um, through like caring for it in that way. And then color sorting this yarn. Um, I think I was categorizing it by fiber and then by saturation and then by dye and then just by color and rearranging and rearranging and rearranging it um, as a way to handle it and yeah, get to know what I was collecting and what I was working with helped a lot. Right on. And then as far as that, uh, real quick, the, the loom that's in this shot, um, is that, uh, that's the loom you said Recology had stored for quite some time? Yeah, um, they had a really wonderful donation. I'm not even sure when it was, um, but a local weaver, Carrie Levine, donated 
that fantastic floor loom as well as her entire um, like dye archive. So I was using her loom and her yarn remnants um, during my time there. And I'm not sure if somebody had used the loom before, but I got to set it up um, and really spend time with all of her tools. Um, she had boxes of loom and weaving equipment as well that I was going through. Wow, that's really incredible. And uh, did, was, I mean, I'm just imagining working in the space and like the, the, the reverberation of sound as you're working uh, in this metal container. Like, I feel like it would just like, I, I'm not a weaver, so I don't know what kind of a zone one gets in when they're weaving, uh, but like how the sounds must have just like helped you get into that zone. <laughs> yeah, well, it's actually really funny. The metal um, aspect the studio that I had at UC Berkeley during this process is also a tin shed, albeit quite a bit larger, um, but a really similar environment. So it didn't feel out of character um, to have this huge loom in a shed alone. Um, yeah. Cool. And how about you, Jin Mei? Oh, sorry, what was that? I also was just gonna say, it's coming to my mind now that I found a loom while I was there. I mean, they're actually things that people throw away quite a lot because they don't know how to use them or to really value them. Um, so I was able to make work from like broken, discarded loom, the same one that I was weaving on. Wow. Unbelievable. And Jinmei, you know, like the, again, the, the quantity of things that you found and there was a slide, I don't, I don't know if it ended up on the final slide presentation, but um, it was like this little Christmas ornament thing on a like tossed hard drive. And I just, again, like kind of thinking of ritual and like, you know, uh, being an artist and being frustrated with, with uh, the frequency at which I, I feel like I don't have an idea, but sometimes like just doing something and making something gets the gears turning. And when I saw that piece, I just imagined you entering the studio and saying like, today I'm not getting anything. Like I'm just gonna put things together until they, they speak to me in the way that I want. But I'm curious what your experience was like working through these materials and you know, uh, if you developed any kind of rituals toward your, uh, your practice. That's actually a very good uh, interpretation of how I felt at the time. Uh, as I said to you, I, um, I planned um, very differently. My proposal was very different. And so I had a very rigid idea. I felt very unproductive for the first however many weeks that I uh, mm -hmm. went through ecology. It was just getting used to the space, cleaning the space, like Shishan said. And for me, I didn't have a car. So it was actually quite a commute there. So every time I had gotten there, I feel like I didn't have time to get anything done or I had completely changed my idea, but I don't know what I'm doing now. All of these um, materials are really, really, um, you know, they're triggering emotionally, either I'm not saying positive or negative, they're very triggering. Um, so then I, I actually just started to collect things and try to, um, or collect things that looked ki kind of like Hannah's sentiment, collect things that seemed okay, that seemed familiar, that seemed like it's not too far from my everyday life. And then I just wanted to own them in my own way. And in a way I wanted to, I guess, um, remarket, repurpose them so that, um, so I, I guess my, um, if, if there is a ritual, it would be, it would be really, I just bagged them, right? I bagged the material. I didn't do very much to them myself. And um, I, I, I think I just curated them and bagged mm -hmm. them. And um, when I was in high school, I created a series of work that to this day, I'm 25, it's been, I was 16, it's been nine years. I'm still proud of that series of work. And one of the reason is I had very little ego when I was in high school. So I didn't create work to specifically um, show uh, kind of like in, in my, in college, I would be creating work to showcase my skill or something I've learned mm. or um, my ability to use the tools or um, I would actually make sure my show has a variety of different techniques um, involved in them, kind of a humble brag. But at Recology, I actually didn't have a car and I didn't have um, a lot of access to the wood shopping, a wood shop. 
um, which is not Recology's fault by any means because they did offer me to use them. It's just the timing didn't line up very well um, with sharing. So I thought, you know, I didn't have to specifically show off my skills. So a uh, staples and scissors <laughs> and glue guns even. It just anything that worked um, for me at the time. So it's not far from what you said, Victor, just going in and say, oh, I don't know what I'm doing today, but I'll see how these materials work with themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah and this, this image kind of leads us into uh, um, the next question, which is, you know, what was your, like thinking about your experience with Recology? I mean, this is, it's a residency and, you know, all of these wonderful people in this, this photograph with, uh, the artists of this year in 2019, they're all really there supporting you along the way, right? Like if you have any questions, oftentimes, you know, people are having lunch together and asking you questions. There's, you know, periodic check-ins. And I'm just curious, you know, uh, because again, you guys were all in school, you were all in school. Um, how, what was your, what was your experience working with the staff, but also with the facilities crew, right? You're, you're walking through that space. And I know in my experience, you know, oftentimes they would find things and be like, do you need this? Um, but yeah, if uh, Hannah, if you want to start us off, you know, what was your experience like with working with the crew as, especially as you worked toward, um, toward your final exhibition, right? You, I'm sure you weren't left alone installing all that stuff, but. Um, so I, at that point in my life and maybe still now was really bad at asking for help. <laughs> um, so I probably could have gotten a lot more help. Um, and, but the, the other Recology staff that were working out in the pile were incredibly helpful at pointing things out. Like some of my favorite loads were like when a flooring company would come in and they would have all of the new flooring off cuts. And so, so they would know that was what I was looking for and pointing mm -hmm. it over there or um, like any, any like good hardwood lumber, all of the people working out in the pile would point me in that direction. Um, and I'm trying to think of heavy things. I feel like it's hard for me to differentiate because I was also there working part-time for the last six years. So <laughs> thinking about <laughs> heavy, heavy things that I needed to move out of there. Um, I think that's probably when I got the most help and we called Micah to come and help me move some heavy, some large yeah. heavy things with the truck. Um, but yeah, overall it was a great experience. I mean, like a, a few, I was there for a few lunches that were great to ask questions and I'd always get asked what I'm doing and I would be like, I don't know yet. <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't know what's gonna happen. I'm making everything I can think of. I think one thing that I, I was was just beginning to get inspired by was like the idea that I might not actually like or have to show everything I make. And just for me, like some of making the work was just like being super productive and then just taking things out if they were not good enough or I didn't like them or, or maybe even just like sitting on them and looking at them for a while. Um, and I think at that point I had just been reading a little bit about Martino Gomper and his hundred chair project. And so that made me think like, I can just keep making things and then decide later. Um, so yeah, the interactions were all really positive. Everyone was super helpful when I asked. <laughs> <laughs> How about any, anyone else? Maybe uh, Shushan, what was your experience like uh, working with this stuff? Cause I also know that leading up to the the final days towards the exhibition, right? Uh, everyone's kind of working with uh, Sharon Spain, who's uh, fourth from the right um, in like coming up with the text for your exhibition. You know, maybe you can talk a little bit about working with her, like working, you probably worked, I think with Hannah at this point, right? Hannah, you were, I think you were hired after this. So Hannah probably might've helped you with the installation, but yeah. Yeah, um, everyone, everyone had great energy and was very sweet and, um, I was very, I was received well. Um, I remember seeing Hannah um, on campus and at Recology, and it was so it was really nice to to see her experience with this space before um, um, doing my own residency there. Um, 
Yeah, everyone, everyone was very passionate about um, the mission of this residency program. And, and that was very evident in, in just the way um, things were run. I remember eating lunch with folks. Um, I remember uh, lo loved, I remember it was so fun spending time um, scavenging for stuff um, and just everyone, uh, the crew members, I mean, um, folks who worked in the, the dump site were really funny. Um, and I just remember always goofing off with them. Uh, yeah, I have only positive things to say about um, working with everyone. It's probably important to point out, I'm getting this in the chat, but that gentleman at the very center kind of framed by the door uh, Micah also a great deal of help during these residencies. I'm sure you all got to experience his helpful hand uh, lifting heavy things or, you know, him sourcing materials and leaving them there for you and they magically appear in your studio You're like, hey, I thought of you. <laughs> Can I echo very quickly what Shushan yeah, said? Absolutely. I just want to say I didn't, I feel like I definitely talk a lot, maybe because of my other job. Um, I, I just want to say Hannah and Micah have uh, been huge help to my work, um, absolutely. So they actually found, did you see the big, the big board? What is it called? Hannah, what is the, it called? The, the pegboard? Pegboard, thank you. Hannah actually, Hannah and Micah, or um, they actually found the pegboard for me which is amazing. My work wouldn't exist without it. And Hannah and Micah helped me with the whole installation. And I remember I was dropping the ball at one of the installation day or the installation day, I forgot, uh, maybe both. <laughs> I, I was either one day I wasn't feeling good at like a very important installation day and Hannah and Micah just took over and helped me entirely. And another day I, oh, it was, um, I had to leave immediately the day after um, the exhibition uh, because my <laughs> I had promised <laughs> this is inverse I promised my grandma that I would be home for New Year's so and it was New Year's so I had I just I was asking Recology is it possible for me to leave like a day early and then I said no problem we'll deinstall for you we'll do all the hard work for you so even that small piece that was framed into a smaller size was not uh, done by me. I just want to point out that behind the artist glory, there's a lot of other people working. Even though my name is on the work, um, everyone at Recology had helped me hugely, especially Hana and Maya. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for, for saying that. And, you know, last we have Ricky and here's a, here's a really wonderful exhibition shot that I'm sure was photographed by Micah. And also just kind of thinking about what your experience was like as you were uh, heading toward the finish line at the, for this exhibition while, you know, the MFA exhibition as well. But I imagine, uh, yeah, what was, what was your experience like with the staff? Um, when you ask that question, the, the only story that comes to mind is really embarrassing, but um, I was just, I remember being really nervous. Um, because the, the pile is in this like huge room and it's kind of loud and there's a bulldozer and there's just like all of these folks, like lots of big men like in suits. And um, I just remember being like really nervous the first day. I took my shopping cart and I like wheeled it into the space and I just like left it in the wrong area while I kind of went and looked around and the bulldozer came and just like went and squished my little shopping cart right up. <laughs> um, like within the first 10 minutes. And I was just like too nervous to like tell anybody. So I just had this dinky little like squished shopping cart all day. Um, but after that, I mean, everyone was just like so friendly and it was the best benefit to, um, yeah, spend a lot of time with the people that are working um, in the pile so that they knew what I was looking for and what was going on that day and learning their tips of looking for things. Um, so yeah, great experiences all around once I got over my nervous energy. Yeah, no, it's definitely, I think I can, I can echo uh, that feeling of, you know, when you walk into that space for the first time, trying to figure out where you fit in within all the motion, because it's everything is happening so fast. And for, you know, folks interested in applying for the residency, it's just, it is very fast paced. And you, uh, because there are uh, many cars coming in, many trucks coming in, you, 
you have to be very aware of where you are physically and where your, your goods are. And, you know, from time to time, the things that you collect, it's not clear that you're saving them if they're not in your cart. So they get to tossed back in maybe on accident. But um, I guess before we move on to the, the last question in the last slide, one thing did come to mind to ask if we could just pause on this slide uh, for a moment is just thinking about, uh, you know, the materials that you did find, um, you know, did, did you have, uh, were there any kind of experiments that you did while you were there? I mean, there wasn't a lot of access to the shop at the time, but I'm curious, like what kinds of risks you took as artists with the materials that you were working with? And uh, maybe you could talk about some of those discoveries and if there perhaps were any failures in, in the work that you were doing, because I think you're there for so long, right? Um, that it really does present you the opportunity and, and the materials, they, they're just, they don't stop coming in. So I'm, I'm curious what kinds of risks you all took, if any, with the, the materials and yeah. And if you could talk a little bit about that. And I'll leave this up for anyone, if they, whoever wants to jump in on this one. I, I, could, I could jump in. I talk a lot, but <laughs> there's a moment of silence, I'll jump in. So, Hannah and Micah, again, another uh, kind of following the previous conversation of how helpful they were. They might have saved my life as well. I don't know if they remember, but I was starting to disassemble a TV. Do you remember that, Hannah? I, I started, I tried to disassemble things. I try to just maybe use um, what's inside. I'm, I was just curious, oh, there's a screw. Let me unscrew it, let me try. And uh, Michael and Hannah saw that and they said, there's a lot of energy in that. You could potentially shock yourself. <laughs> and I don't think that's the kind of risk, Victor, you were talking about, <laughs> but that is certainly a realistic risk in that um, situation. <laughs> so um, yeah, and when you said material failure, I had uh, found a lot of uh, sugar, um, kind of those, uh, flowers that are made out of icing sugar and you can decorate cakes with them so i glued i glued a lot of those pieces onto um, plastic children's toys and a um, few days before the exhibition it got quite humid and i saw them started sweating so i started sweating as well <laughs> because i was worried that they won't last through the exhibition but luckily um they were okay, so uh, I guess it was almost a uh, material failure. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Any like exciting risks or uh, exciting material failures in your process? Nothing is necessarily coming to mind. I think by default, everything felt like a risk because it was well, mm. everything was interesting. But I, I. I'm trying to remember what I had collected and what never made it into my show. But I was always, uh, I, remember I collected a lot of foam and I, I never did anything with it. Um, I think if anything, I was just, I was trying to remain open um, to and see what like material and see how the material wanted to be transformed. So I think I was good about like collecting stuff, even if um, it didn't end up turning into an actual piece. Sure. When you say what what the material wanted to what the material wanted to be transformed to is, you, it sounds like you were having a special relationship with the materials as, as they came yeah. across. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Um, like I think how, once how... I found I guess I once I found my my rhythm I was r really making the same type piece over and over again but um I think in the beginning um it was really important to not uh, approach making work with like very clear intentions because that limited sort of the types of surprises that um that came up um once I just wanted to make sure that like during my time there that I was spending enough time playing and I think mm -hmm. that's that's when you find interesting processes. Right, right. Yeah. Cool. I guess we'll move on. Uh, before we open it up to uh, questions, if anyone has any questions, you know, feel free to pop them into the, the chat and we'll ask them to the artists. Um, 
But uh, I guess for the last question that I have for you all, um, I'm just curious in, in what ways that this um, residency might have changed your practice moving forward after the residency um, and what kinds of things you learned from recology that maybe carried over into any of the things you do professionally now. Um, and, and then also just, you know, maybe give us an update on what you're working on now and where you're headed. And we can start off, I think, um, we can start off, I don't know what slide we're on here. Next slide, keep going. Uh, yeah, we can start off with Hana. Hey. Um, so after my residency, uh, my work, well, I continued working at the dump part-time throughout my senior year of school and up until March of this year. Um, but my entire senior thesis show was really inspired by my time at Recology. Um, it continued with wanting to make useful objects um, and it was all made out of found materials as well. Um, I think in my time, I collected a lot of excess heart, uh, like wood and building materials, um, as well as like, I think the thing that never made it into my show was that when I went to school, I thought I was gonna be a textiles major and I ended up in furniture because it felt like I could do whatever I wanted <laughs> as long as I built something. Um, and so I had, I had collected quite a bit of fabric um, like wool suits uh, and also like spent hours sitting joining little fibers with heat, sh heat shrink material and so I had this like spool of fibers in my room for the next like four years until I moved and threw them away again um, but so for my thesis I made useful objects I made uh, four ironing boards all made out of found materials um, inspired by ironing boards I had found in the trash. Um, four brooms, dust pans, hangers, potato mashers, set of dinnerware, a quilt made out of the um, wool suits. And yeah, so a lot of my work is inspired by creating multiples that have the same process, um, but using different materials or using different found objects come make something unique. So kind of defining that process. And so the slide here is a series of brooms that are both functional and sculptural um, made out of spindles, some of which I've probably had stashed in my living room since my residency at Recology. Um, I just had like a big bucket full of spindles since then. A few of them were used in a piece, a ladder piece for my show. Um, but yeah, I feel like I'm still between school and recology. Seven years later, I'm still kind of working down that same value, function, found materials, whatever possible. Excellent, cool, thank you. And next slide. And Jinmei, you're, <laughs> you're teaching now. Can you talk yeah. to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I oh. actually, it's very, like everything comes a full circle for me. Where I, where I taught, uh, where I teach now, I used to go to classes there and where I work now at the Kingston School of Art, it's a registered charity where I work as a, I'm the children's program <laughs> coordinator here, um, but I do teach some adult classes as well. And um, in the, in the daytime, uh, weekdays, I teach at the school board as a grade seven teacher. So today I actually, or yesterday, I actually assigned my class a work called um, Environmental or Social Self-Portrait. And before that, I had prefaced them with a lot of my personal work, including the work from Recology because um, it really relates to what we're learning in science. <laughs> So it, a lot of things come full circle for me. Um, and I, I would say Recology impacted me a lot. Um, before Recology, a lot of my work were very dark actually, um, both visually and um, conceptually. They were um, a lot more um, personal and maybe um, things that I, I find to be disturbing that I maybe want to get over. But agroecology, it's still uh, 
not necessarily the happiest if you read my magazine or my my flyers that I created is not necessarily the most cherry work on the planet, but it was a lot more lighthearted in the presentation, as well as it was a lot more accessible to public. And I think at Recology, while I was um, while I was there, there were student groups coming in and there were different groups of people from the community coming in. And suddenly I bursted this bubble of um, being in the art world, speaking to artists with uh, big words and uh, name dropping. And just, it was refreshing to be speaking about my art practice to people who are genuinely just interested and not, um, uh, does not have kind of a art critic lens, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, and then I look back at pretty much my whole life. Everything I've done is related to um, everything I've been interested in, volunteered at or worked at is, has been sur surrounding like education, um, ch charity related work, um, art and um, sustainability actually since since the very beginning since middle school high school every club I was in was environmental club it was um, like the events I was part participating in was um, stop shark finning <laughs> like things that are uh, very much about environmental sustainability and now as a grade seven teacher I'm like pounding it into their head and we have a garden now we made our own pumpkin pie from scratch from the pumpkins we grew, from the compost we composted. And so like my lifestyle is slowly becoming the lifestyle that I've always um, hoped for. And um, I think my end goal is just that eventually I don't have, I, I can live a life where I live in the reality or in the values I believe in. Like I actually embody those values instead of just advocating for them. Um, and for me, it just has come a full circle. My grade seven teacher actually works here. So, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. yeah, so awesome. very cheesy, but very, <laughs> very, um, very much impacted and recalled sure. a very important part of it. Excellent. Cool. Who do we have next? Uh, Ricky. Um, can you ask me the question again? I'm sorry. Uh, just curious, you know, uh, how this residency might have changed your, your practice, um, if it did at all, and what kinds of things that you might have learned at Recology that carried over into your professional practice as an artist afterward, and, you know, uh, any kind of updates on what you're working on now? Um, yeah, if it, Recology was so recent for me. I mean, it was only a year ago. Um, so I feel like I am still processing a lot of what I learned there and experienced, um, as well as I've also gotten to stay engaged um, because there is this incredible resource of um, kind of getting picking rights afterwards. Um, so I have been back and visited the pile and gather materials again and have been able to kind of incorporate that into my routine living in the Bay Area. Um, when I really need something, I've gone there for metal and for wood. Um, I think the thing that changed for me the most was that coming into the program, I already had a really frugal habit in the studio of scavenging a lot of materials or beginning projects off of resources that other people had discarded and using that as a place to um, start sculpturally or start materially with what is available to me. Um, and then there was so much abundance and so much waste at Recology that it kind of, I think, satiated some things in me where I, mm. I didn't necessarily feel like um, I had to be burdened with how much waste is constantly around all of us and to find the need to necessarily only use that, um, but to get to see it as all material and um, I, I don't know, gave myself a little bit more space to pick and choose what really strikes me um, and be more um, aware of really like what I am bringing into my studio and, and what feels special to me and what I really connect with versus just what's really wonderful material and somebody would need and has some kind of value. Um, so I've definitely altered my perception of 
yeah, both abundance and resources that are available and um, honed in more on what I really resonate with and what works for me, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And this this exhibition uh, appeared on uh, your website and uh, seemed like it was not long after your residency, in fact, because uh, there were some of the pieces from the residency in this exhibition, right? Um, or may maybe? I don't think that there was actually, but yeah, this was last summer um, at England Gilbert Gallery that's now closed in Minnesota Street. Mm -hmm. um, and it was definitely a continuation of a lot of the trains of thought that I had had moving through ecology and through graduate school um, and really seeing cloth as something that's very gestural that I can relate to in terms of framing time and framing the abilities of um, the way I embody the space that I'm in. Um, so a lot of the drapery I was working with at Ecology um, probably formally transferred over, over that summer. Gotcha. Cool. Thank you. And then last, uh, and just one more reminder to anyone watching, if you have any questions, just pop them into the chat. Um, while well, Shushan tells us about what she's been up to since the residency. And I just pulled this from uh, some internet digging, but it was cool to see uh, this photograph. Yes, I, I, I love this photo. Um, for me, the, the residency was just a time for me to really lock in about um, what I cared about in this world and what I wanted to use my art practice for. And I think since then, it's, it's been a little over six years, I've gotten to venture out into other um, thought spaces. Um, uh, I've spent a lot of my time post school teaching. Um, this photo is um, a photo of two of my students from a workshop I taught uh, through the Richmond um, Art Center um, and kind of like what I did at my opening, I, I've been, I taught students how to make their own weaving materials out of like uh, or, uh, discarded uh, materials, but also just like um, old yarn that was donated to the center. Um, and I did that for about four years. And more recently, I, I studied urban planning at Cal and right now, post-grad school, um, while I'm trying to figure out what my next chapter is, I'm really trying to, to envision a career that um, takes sort of the values from my art practice and community arts world and um, think, think about how I can bring those values and ways of relating to material and to one another at a larger scale and, and thinking about how these, uh, these environmental issues we think about um, how they exist in like a, a city scale. And so yeah. this is an important time for me to be reflecting about what I care about. And so it's been nice also just um, looking back at these slides um, and seeing like what the thread has been. Yeah, it, I mean, it was definitely wonderful to come across this after seeing, uh, you know, patrons to your exhibition engaging with the work and participating with it uh, to see that kind of like, oh, this still exists uh, in your practice in some way, shape or form. Um, we have a question from an audience member um, and it seems like it falls in line with what we just asked, but did this residency change how, how any of you consume commercial materials in your daily life? Who wants to, to jump off on that one? Um, I, can, <laughs> I can I can take that question. Um, or and you can think. <laughs> so you can think. So I I I don't I can't say that um, well I am zero waste now, I have um, this and that. I, I can't uh, claim that I have changed that much. But part of the reason I moved back to Canada was on top of um, the politics. It was also because uh, my mother owns this place in Canada and I was renting at in California. And just thinking about the, the position I was in to be um, just leaving this giant place in a it's giant and it's cheap because it's in a very small town in Canada where I live 
I actually, it just blew my own mind that I was doing that at the time, that I was in a complete different country, um, three countries away from where I was originally from. And I'm consuming all of this stuff. I'm traveling constantly. I would throw thousands of dollars um, in for just plane tickets to visit Canada, visit China, back and forth. And um, every time I were to even buy a rice cooker <laughs> or a, a pot while I was a student in California, I would be thinking of all the stuff I already have at home mm -hmm. that I could be using. And I know it seems, well, you, you moved for that. Oh, that's one of actually a big reason was just thinking that my family have all these resources and I'm trying to be rebellious and I'm trying to be, um, um, live my own life and do all of these cool things in, you know, in this very um, uh, popular or famous city of California. And part of me just felt very selfish personally, because um, because I I have all these resources that I didn't need to repurchase. And we have um, land that we can grow food as we now do. We probably harvested, my partner grew probably uh, 20 pumpkins and probably 400 tomatoes this year. And we just stopped buying groceries for a while. And it's just, um, I wouldn't say my entire life has changed. We still use plastic. We still, I'm teaching my students about fossil fuels and plastic and composting landfills and all of the things that I am still partaking, but I am hoping that Recology have impacted me um, yeah. in a minor way, at least. And Hannah, I wasn't sure, you looked like you were gonna jump in to answer. I don't know if you had any thoughts on how this might've changed the way you consume commercial materials. So it's hard for me because I was like, while well, my residency was four months, I was there for a long time. Um, <laughs> so we're like the difference between just being there for four months, having an impact versus the last seven years. Um, it has definitely impacted me. I think that there is a, like going into it, I already did have some part of my life that was like enjoying thrifting and like garage sales and finding things used and I was also raised with like Ikea furniture that has lasted 30 years and so I have this idea of like it can last if you take care of it um but I now live in a house that's filled with mostly stuff that was found in the trash wow. everything behind <laughs> me <laughs> the chair I'm sitting in um <laughs> And it definitely has, like I'm leaving the Bay Area in general and having Recology as like the um, waste company that picks up compost and recycling and moving to somewhere where they don't pick up glass and you have to drop it off and they don't even recycle it has made me like being at work and then same with compost there's no compost there's no green waste pickup um i definitely am, am more encouraged to like do the extra step to put the green waste in the truck and take it to drop it off versus just being like oh well they don't do it here um and same with glass like even the glass that does that you can drop off they break for fill and so like there's a reuse place around the corner. So I save all my jars and wash them and take them there. And I actually try to consume less glass. Um, and so Recology definitely wow. had a big impact on that. Uh, wow. Not necessarily like perfect in my life of not using anything disposable, but it makes me aware of the things that I am purchasing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we did have one more question, but out of uh, respect for all the time and effort you all put into this, I wanna uh, slowly bring this to an end. Um, just have two more slides just for a couple of announcements. Um, first, thank you all to the panelists and thank you for again to all the folks who showed up and the folks who are making this possible working uh, behind scenes. Um, but uh, our current student artists in residence, Leila Talukder, uh, will be hosting some workshops. I believe the October one may have happened this week already, uh, but there's another one coming November 5th five food scraps you can turn into dye, and then another one in December, basic mending to end 
to extend the life of your clothing. And then uh, if you're curious about that, those workshops and other announcements and other artists interviews, um, you can go to our Instagram and follow us. There there's videos, um, there's photographs and documentation of exhibitions. And uh, you know, you can see the stories featuring artists in residence and student art and artists in residence. So thank you everybody for coming tonight. Thank you again, artists, fantastic work. Thank you, Victor, for leading such a wonderful and meaningful conversation. I really appreciate your efforts. And thank you to all the artists and everybody who joined us.